All right, thank you, Ed, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my wife does have Bill the Goat here, so you know uh, I am rooting for Navy. So. Uh, I am, as, as Ed said, I'm going to try to move through things quickly so we have more time. My talk is going to try to give you some background about Confucian theory, uh, ethical theory, and some of its implications. Um, and I'm going to spend, uh, so that's what I'm going to spend most of my time doing, and then making a few comments about how it differs from certain classical ethical theories in the West, such as Aristotle's virtue ethics. And the last part is I'm going to say how Confucianism has been appropriated, uh, I think, and often profoundly distorted by contemporary Chinese uh, administration, and how I don't think Confucianism will help you to try to understand what the Chinese government is going to do. Um, uh, but I do think it would help you a lot in your interactions with, and I hope work with, uh, Chinese uh, people in general. All right, so a little bit about Confucius. Confucianism is named after the founder. It's a Latinization of his Chinese name, which is Kong, his surname, plus Fuzi, meaning kind of master, master Kung. Kung Fuzi becomes Confucius. Um, Confucius himself doesn't say, claim himself to be an originator. He said, I'm just a transmitter, not a maker. I'm someone who collected the wisdom of the past and wants to pass it down. Of course, when people say that, they, they, they may obscure the fact that they select what of the past gets passed down. So there's some kind of creative process in that. Um, he had a very idealized picture of the past. Um, but he, he, I think the important thing is he thought there was wisdom embodied in the institutions and history of his culture. That's something I think in the West, Western ethical theory we tend to underplay quite a bit, that there's, we, wanna, we wanna know what's the reason, what's the rational argument for a certain proposition, well and good. But often what, we, what we're relying on to get through our day is wisdom that's embodied in the kind of rational choices of people that have come before us and formed excellent institutions and practices. I think you are now a living, uh, the, ex the experience of going through an institution that has very definite practices that are shaping you in certain ways, uh, I think mostly, almost all for the good, uh, at least speaking from my own experience. Uh, but there's a lot embedded in there that you may not understand, it may not be transparent to wisdom or to, to reason at a given point. Maybe will uh, become a transparent in the fullness of time, or at least as you get more experience. So Kungzi and later Confucians advocated a set of virtues uh, that, as I say, some degree overlap with, but do not necessarily coincide with those of ancient Greece and Rome. Um, for that matter, the virtues of ancient Greece and Rome don't overlap 100% with many things we consider virtue. There was nothing like charity or compassion in ancient Greece among the virtues. Uh, but Confucius um, con wanted people to cultivate virtues like courage and wisdom that are shared in the ancient Greek uh, tradition. But one of his uh, central virtues was what he called filial piety and care. Um, and uh, what he meant by filial piety, sometimes it's caricatured, but essentially just an appreciation and love for your parents. Right? And he thought that this was an important thing to learn. You learn it first in your, in your family uh, because it's the first place where you're going to learn or you're going to experience people caring for you. Now maybe we can talk about it in the, uh, as, a, as a constructive ethicist, I'm very interested in how um, natural selection and contemporary empirical psychology should inform ethical theory. And one of, the, one of the things that I think is just pretty well documented is that the first place we do experience people caring for us, for us, is if you have a good caregiver. If you're, if you're blessed to have good parents, they're the first pe people who took care of you. And as creatures, we need that care for quite a while. You know, if you've ever watched a horse being born, you know it just kind of comes out, and then a few minutes later it stands up and starts to walk. Whereas when you do have children, you'll find out they don't do that. They just sit there and make a lot of noise for quite a while and get you to do everything. Right. So Confucius is saying it's the family where we first learn care, and we're supposed to take that care, develop it, um, make it more mature, if you will, and then extend it out to the rest of the world. Um, and uh, we should, uh, like, uh, similarly, another object of our filial piety would be the traditions in which we grow up. 
So we should be appreciative of what we inherit. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't question it, but it does mean we prima facie uh, think that it's of some value. Uh, and uh, that's, that, that's the impo an important part for developing mature senses of things like courage or say loyalty, right? Um, um, so the Confucian tradition, while it overlaps, has this uh, uh, emphasis on filial piety in the family. <clears throat> and by extending these, we're supposed to sp spread them out to other kinds of uh, activities. Uh, now, when I say they start in the family, they sometimes refer to these as sprouts, so they're not mature. You have, you have a sprout of compassion, right? Meaning you have the beginnings of compassion, but then you have to develop it into a mature sense of compassion so that you're just not being sweet to everybody, but you're being appropriately uh, kind in the right ways to the right extent for the right reasons, right? Um, similarly, I, I think people have uh, very kind of sprouts of what he would call deference, meaning, you know, there are, there are situations, for instance, if you walk up to a door at the same moment, we tend to at least defer to another person, at least many people do. We feel like we need to order ourselves, right? Of course, there are the people that just, you know, sharp elbow you, but they aren't the tend, to, tend to be the people that get uh, held up as ideals, right? So that kind of deference, again, is a sprout. Well, what are you supposed to do with that? Well, you're supposed to find how to develop that and apply it in a mature and complete uh, human life. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that when I talk about this next thing, which is the rights. So Confucians uh, think the way you develop your sprouts of virtues is one of the most important ways is through the rights. Um, and what do, what do I mean by rights? Well, for us, rights usually mean something really grand, like uh, you know, a, a grand ceremony, uh, and that, they included those things in, in Confucianism, but they often, in fact, for the most part, focus on more everyday things. The way you greet somebody, the way you carry yourself, the way you dress, are all thought to have a ritual component. Um, things that we call more manners and etiquette. I, I hope to make this clear in the next slide or two. Right? So what, basically what they're saying is, the, the, the standard ways we have for interacting with one another are really a lot more important to our ethical lives than we give them credit for. For what they shape, on the one hand, the way we think about ourselves and other people, and they also ex give us a means of expressing certain kinds of things like respect, respect and care. And as I've said, the, they're very, we're very attentive to things like the way you dress and carry yourself, the music you listen to, they, a, they were big on music. Uh, the way you meet and greet other people, right? Because, again, they on the one, these practices shape us and they also give us a way of expressing ourselves. Right? So to give you an example, I mean, the way you, you, uh, you uh, meet and greet someone in our culture, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I got one more slide before I get to that. So, again, I'm just going to highlight, I think most people in the West don't, think about rights very much. In fact, when you say rights, they go, whoa, <laughs> that's not something that's important in my life. I wanna argue today that they are more important than we realize and we neglect them uh, to our disadvantage and uh, uh, that, the, that we would be better off paying more attention to them. So here's some example, here's some, I'll give you a greater sense of what I mean. When we meet people in the West, I mean, if you go to Asia, you're gonna meet people they're gonna bow or they're gonna salute you or there are different people have different ways of meeting and greeting. We tend to uh, shake each other's hands uh, and look each other in the eye and say hello. That's the kind of thing that Confucians would regard as a ritual. <clears throat> but of course, it's also how you do this. Do you have a firm handshake? Do you um, look the person in the eye or do you like uh, you know, look off into the distance? Um, and the idea is, if you do this and invest yourself in it, you're, you're kind of putting your spirit, your, yourself, into greeting this person, expressing uh, that you're happy to see him uh, and that you're not a threat, right? Uh, and people uh, uh, who see that, understand that of you, it also shapes you, right? Um, and, I, and I submit that if we were in a situation where you hold your hand out to somebody, and they don't extend their hand in return, you, it's, it's going to be, a, it's not just a, a minor thing in our culture. 
that, that's an insult. They're saying that you, for some reason, they don't even want to recognize you as a person, right? <clears throat> so I think that we're, our lives are actually informed by a lot of rituals. Some of them are grand. When you graduate from here, you're going to go through a ceremony that's very grand. Uh, we go to uh, other kinds of ceremony, but the common social rituals are the day-to-day -day ones that the Confucians uh, want to focus on. So, you know, we have things like when you sneeze, people say, I, God bless you. Uh, when you uh, get married, you're going to have a very formal ritual. Uh, if you uh, have participated in the funerals, if you've buried our dead, we have a particular uh, ritual for that, and we have particular rituals in the military for that. Um, and as I mentioned, when you graduate, you're going to have a certain kind of ceremony. There's going to be, and in that ceremony, I've mentioned music. It's almost always the same music. I just watched people, the assembly, the formation for lunch, before lunch, and uh, they played, of course, they didn't just play the latest uh, hit off of the, the radio, they played Anchors Away and uh, the Marine Corps anthem. So we sing in, in, in a national anthem at our uh, play, sporting events, and, and it's another place where people shake hands before and after the game as a way of expressing equality and uh, if you think you've, you've been treated fairly at the end of the contest, you shake hands again. Uh, I know they teach you all boxing, which is, a, I think, a good thing. Um, and even in, in a boxing match, if you box, uh, you shake hands before and after. Uh, or if you don't, uh, you, you show disrespect to your opponent. Now, of course, I think the military is shot full of this, this kind of attention to small things. Um, and I think it's something that's really special about that kind of, that form of life. Uh, you may sometimes say, gee, I wish you were a little bit less special today. But uh, the attention to having set ways of doing things um, is really important. It's shaping you, and I think in ways that you'll be able to, that you do understand, and you'll understand more fully over time. But people outside the military, I think, often look at this as simply an attempt to get you to conform. You know, uh, and well, of course, there's something to that. I mean, people march together, they do form more solidarity. But that's, if that's what you think it's about, you're, you're missing it. Uh, it's about uh, sharing a form of life, inculcating discipline, um, uh, and it's not uh, just for conformity or some kind of strange fetish. And, and I think Confucians would, uh, are very, um, uh, tuned into this because they see rights as a kind of language for uh, shaping and expressing, as I say. Um, uh, if you don't have them or if you don't practice them sincerely, you can't live a certain kind of meaning. So here, here's another example. You know, how would you express that you're happy to see someone if you didn't have some kind of shared cultural form, like shaking hands? You, know, you walk up to somebody and you, you want to express that you're happy to see them. You know, you're going to rub your stomach and chirp or something. I mean, you come up with your own idea. It's not going to, not going to communicate. I mean, you're probably going to have a lot of people running from you, right? Uh, you need to have some kind of shared uh, cultural language, if you will, in order to even communicate, hey, I'm happy to see you. Or if you want to show respect to someone, or you want to show that you recognize them as holding a certain uh, a place. You need to have some kind of shared ritual in order to do that. And by, it, by practicing that ritual, you not only kind of cultivate yourself with that attitude, but you're able to convey it to, to the person and the people around you. Now, you, I know you, you take this pledge. I've taken it myself. That in part goes, you uphold, you're going to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, you can just say that. Some people might just say that. People, actors just say that. But if you take it in a ceremony and you see other people saying this, and if you think about it, as I have for over many years, it, it uh, will change how you feel about yourself, how you think about yourself, and how you, you conduct yourself in the world, um, and how you feel connected to other people. You know, everybody here, uh, when you finish, you're going to be connected to the person, people next to you and around you in ways that are really rare in the world. Uh, 
Um, and uh, you know, when my when my former uh, comrades in arms come over and visit my wife, she can tell you that uh, at our house, she can tell you it's really strange. They're in like their own kind of world, you know. So it's a it's a different kind of thing. So what am I saying? So Confucians hold human beings have a mate nature that inclines them toward care, right? And they think that that is part of a family, and that that's the beginning of a process that gets you to cultivate yourself to fulfill roles larger than yourself. And they think that if you do that, it's not just kind of, um, <laughs> you're not just eliminating yourself, so to speak, but you're actually expanding yourself so you can fit into something larger and more meaningful. If you just pursue your own ends, you're not going to be able to uh, uh, experience that. Now, Confucianism today. Confucianism is alive and well in the world and plays a big part in remarkable cultures like Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and beyond. Um, and I think a lot of that can be seen in their views about human nature, what humans are inclined to do. For instance, the focus on the family, needs for education, uh, respect for tradition, and a general concern for communal well-being, things we can talk about. They also have a much greater emphasis on ritual. So if you go and live in an East Asian community, uh, you're going to have to be more attentive. But in a way, I think in some ways, uh, you're primed to be more attentive to their, to their rituals, their social norms and rituals. And this was, I think, very obvious when my wife and I were living in Korea. And uh, uh, Bill Gates, who I, I greatly admired, met, uh, visited and met Pak Geun-hee, the, the woman president at the time of Korea. And this is how not to shake hands in Korea. So, so Gates went up, you know, and he's doing some kind of thing in his pocket, and he's got a hand here, and he's kind of crouched over. The next day in the, in the newspapers, the Korean newspapers were, oh my gosh, who's this guy, Gates? The, you know, doesn't he appreciate that he was meeting the president? Looks like he's hanging out with one of his friends playing, well, I, I, I won't say what I think he's playing. I mean, it's not the way to shake hands. You should be more formal. You should have held his hand straight. He shouldn't have his other hand in his pocket. Um, it's important how you conduct yourself. Rituals matter because they think that they express something, uh, and so they're going to be much more attentive um, to rituals. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip my sea turtle thing, even though I love that, because I, I need to get done here. Um, uh, so I believe Confucians, uh, so Confucianism, to take away, the takeaways, Confucians have uh, a set of rituals, I mean, a set of virtues, slightly different virtues than us. They think virtue begins in the family and is expanded outward to the rest of society, focusing on the care and uh, uh, differentiations of respect you find within a family. Uh, my, uh, now, I, I think that you're right about a lot of those things, uh, but I'm also going to uh, qualify my praise and then talk about contemporary China within three minutes. Um, I think one thing that is a part of Confucianism that I think is unfortunate is that they place too much emphasis on sages. Right? Um, they think that there are people that, are have, that know everything, that pass down this knowledge. Um, now, it's of course embodied in the tradition as well, but they do put a lot of emphasis on there being a sagely leader. Uh, now, when I was a young... Uh, 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 member of the Marine Corps, this appealed to me greatly. I wanted to be the person that put aside all my selfish interests and could just see what needed to be done. And then when I was done, I knew I did what the right thing. But as I, be, as I lived more of life, I came to worry about these ideas. I don't think anybody knows everything. I think there, no matter how good you are or how hard you work, you're going to have regrets and that we shouldn't have a model that thinks people are perfect. We should have a model that says we strive for perfection, but that we're all uh, uh, going to fall short of it and need to stay um, uh, aware of that. So I think that Confucianism should ad adapt uh, a more uh, less stringent view about sagehood. I don't think anybody's perfection. Uh, and they should also uh, think more about the importance of finding your own way instead of just having it kind of looking up to others to, to do this. And I think that that's what you find if you go to places like Korea or Taiwan. 
uh, which are very vibrant democratic systems with very strong, robust pictures of human rights, you're going to find a kind of more adapted view of Confucianism. And I alert you to that because I don't think uh, Confucianism is a static um, system. Uh, so, okay, now on in the last few minutes, the situation in the PRC is very different. And I think you shouldn't be misled by the government's appeals to Confucianism. The PRC government likes to say we're Confucians. We have a different value system than you guys, so you can't tell us what to do. All, all countries, all societies live in different cultural norms. Uh, so here's one example. The modern uh, PRC government argues that they aim to create a harmonious society, which is a good thing. I mean, who doesn't want to, who's against harmony? Well, I don't know, some, some musicians seem to be against harmony, but they shouldn't be. Uh, so, so harmony for them requires embracing though, uh, the, a particular view of things. It demands that everyone listen to the leader and harmonize with the leader. And they, they claim that this is a Confucian virtue, but they're wrong. Uh, and they're right that Confucians advocate harmony, but their harmony, their concept of harmony presupposes difference. What I mean by that is the two most famous examples of harmony in the Confucian tradition are what a great cook is able to do with different flavors. You keep these different flavors, but you blend them in a way that brings out something more than any, than any flavor could be by itself. So if you like me, like Chinese food, if you think of hot and sour soup, right? You have different conflicting flavors that you blend. Or music, that's the other example from ancient China. And they say, what is music? Music is taking different notes and harmonizing them not eradicating them, getting one string and just going boing, boing, you know. So harmony do, uh, doesn't mean sameness. Harmony means taking divergent views and bringing them together um, in uh, disparate elements into a more harmonious whole. We have as one of our mottos in this country, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And this is more the ideal. And the other thing is that, is that leaders, the people that are in charge, whether they be uh, you know, a great chef or a musician, uh, has to find a way to, to make harmony out of the disparate elements. Right? It's not just to impose your own view, but to harmonize those elements among them, to draw people together. Uh, but that's not the view of, of the PRC. Um, their, their views say, no, you've got to listen to the party, and you just have to fall in line. And, and do what you're told. And that's how you get harmony. And so I think that's a clear example of, of one of many places where they'll appeal to some traditional notion, but then they'll distort it uh, uh, for their own. Uh, and of course, if that's your picture that you should listen to the party, well, then that happens to be in the party's best interest, not necessarily in yours or mine. All right, so then what should you do? Uh, I, th when I, I said, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think you want to confuse the Chinese people with their government. I don't think you should do that anywhere. <laughs> right? um, uh, Confucian values um, about the family uh, are held, though, by a lot of people in China today and throughout East Asia. Uh, so you, if you distinguish between the party, the government and the party, you'll be able to keep in mind, if you keep in mind some of the ideas about values and rituals, you'll be able to understand and work more effectively and I think more humanely with uh, Chinese counterparts and people in Korea and other countries, and even some of our fellow Americans here in this great land. So it'd be foolish, I think, and dangerous to believe the current government adheres to Confucian values. Um, they only appeal to Confucianism to give themselves a patina of morality, both at home and abroad. Uh, so I don't think it's gonna help you that much uh, to, to understand Confucianism if your aim is to try to understand what Professor, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping is doing, I think he's primarily interested in, in increasing the power and the prestige of Mr. Xi Jinping, um, just like Mr. Putin. Uh, even Marxist principles, if you study some Marxism, they're not very good Marxists. Uh, they're, they're a very highly classified, uh, stratified society with some people having tremendous amounts of, of wealth. So she presents uh, serious challenges, I think, to the world uh, and to the Chinese people who are part of that world. 
And an appreciation of Confucianism won't help you very much to understand them. I think it often is a distraction. Um, uh, but it does offer you, I think, ways to appeal to and work with other Chinese actors, and maybe even to learn something about your own life and, and how you uh, arrange your values and, and, and uh, absorb your values, uh, especially through the uh, idea of rights. And I think that's it. That's uh, time. Thank you. Nine, nine minutes for questions, so let them fly. Yeah, here, and then here. Um, so I should make the request talk. Um, I was wondering, like, what other ways does the Communist Party, like, reverse um, Confucianism, and like, how can we use that to our advantage to either, like, um, strengthen our own moral appeal or appeal to, like, the Chinese people? Yeah. Um, well, uh, <laughs> I think uh, one thing that, as I mentioned, I think Confucianism can at times tend to rely too much on the sage. And I think contemporary leaders in China portray themselves as sage-like. And they want the people to defer to them. Now, I think that happens all the way up and down the society. And I think it happens in the military. So, uh, you know, I was actually, Ed didn't mention this to you, I, I was a sergeant, I wasn't an officer. You know, we have in this military, our military, NCOs who are given, uh, while we rely on the officer corps uh, to figure out what we should be doing, if we're out on our own, we're encouraged to take our own initiative. That's not something you're gonna see in, in Chinese military. I mean, it's not built into the structure. Frankly, it's the same thing with the Russian military. They don't have an NCO uh, core. So, so there's, a, there's a certain sense where people are relying too much on the leader. So I think that two things you might do is one is, I mean, there's, there's a kind of tactical advantage you can take if people are not directed, right, at the lower echelon. But there's another one by saying, like, well, what do you think? You know, if you meet people individually, it's like, say, like, well, you know, I, I, I respect my superiors, but I don't think they're, they're sages, right? I, I, if I, and if I think there's something wrong with what they're doing, it's, in fact, incumbent upon me to, in private, to raise my questions with them. So I, I think that's a, just a really fundamentally different way of seeing how you fit in, even recognizing a hierarchy that you're, I mean, I know my captain wanted me to come and tell him uh, if he was, well, I, I won't use certain expressions, if he was making a mistake, you know, he wanted me to tell him in private if he thought something was going wrong in the unit. That is not encouraged in, in this kind of caricature of Confucianism. Yeah. Sir, the Jim Fodas Brandy Court. How would Confucianism in the modern day handle like abusive households um, or families that don't have sort of that like those stems of virtue? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I think practically speaking, they 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 don't put enough attention on this, um, but uh, I I think I did say when I was introducing this idea that if it would be if, if you're blessed and have good parents. <laughs> They, they give you that environment. If not, you might need to sink this from other primary caregivers. I think it's, let, let me put it this way. I think as a policy, we need to be very worried about kids that are in very bad abusive relation, I'm sorry, abusive environments, right? If they don't get treated well when they're really young, the idea that they're gonna grow up thinking, you know, trusting people, <laughs> uh, feeling care for other people, there's overwhelming evidence that they won't. So I think if you followed Confucian principles, you should be more proactive than they are about identifying and addressing uh, bad environment situations. And so should we. I mean, it's the most important. I've taught at really great universities all my life, and, and I tell the parents at graduation, my job was easy. Because by the time your son and daughter got here, they were already well shaped. So, I mean, I, it was enjoyable what I did, but I think the hard work happens at the very early stages of, of life. So, yeah. Sir, Mr. Chairman, second class forward, you meet, uh, based upon Confucianism's stratified, emphasis on a stra more stratified society and knowing your role in society, does it make itself more susceptible to exploitation by government than Western forms of governance? In my view, yes. I, and I was trying to get at that with the, there's a little too much, um, uh, kind of practice of deferring to authority, right? But I don't think it's part of the 
the kind of DNA of, of Confucianism because everybody's got the same sprouts and you can cultivate. So there are strands in the Confucian tradition that fight against, have fought against that. But in general, yes, I think there's, I think they're not the only society where conformity uh, is, is excessive. Um, I think in our own age, it's not so much our ideology that leads to that, but our, actually our technology may be leading us to that. That people go online first thing in the morning and they go on their Facebook page and they have, hear all of these negative things about people we don't like and they just kind of have a, a ritual of condemnation and anger. Uh, and that's, I think, a really bad thing. And we all have to kind of become aware of that. So yeah, I think there is a tendency. I worry that it's a tendency in modern technological societies as well as traditional societies. But a good point, yeah. So Richard of Third Class Ross, I was wondering, in your opinion, how do you find that the younger generation that's growing up right now in China <laughs> might be shifting away from Confucianism? <laughs> might it be something that they only really think about in family terms now? Yeah, e excellent question, yeah. So, um, uh, my wife, who's here, by the way, she's, she's Chinese, and, and I met her many years ago. She lived during the end part of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and uh, I always thought, gee, uh, she and her family, or brothers and sisters, aren't going to show very much inclination toward Confucianism or kind of traditional Chinese beliefs. That's not true. Um, while they're very modern, educated people, have a different kind of worldview, they still have parts of this kind of in their kind of cultural DNA. And I think the same goes with contemporary kids. They, of course, are much more, frankly, more and more people in uh, you know, industrialized society, they're very global. They, they, you are more global, right? You probably listen to more Korean music. I mean, when I, when I was your age, nobody even heard of Korean music. You know? <laughs> now Korean music is a global phenomenon. So there's a lot more, these folks are connected much more laterally across the globe. So Confucianism, your local customs have less uh, kind of exclusive control of you, right? So yeah, I think that it's much less. But you know, our my my nieces and nephews in China still think about you know filial piety, still feel a great obligation to their family, still feel a great obligation to community, and one that I'm per particularly like. I didn't have time to talk. Is they think if you're educated you have a greater burden, you have a greater obligation to serve your, your country, your community and, and the world because you know more. Um, and so I think that's a, a value they still hold on to and I think it's a good one, but in other areas that much, much less, particularly women. Men, women don't want to hear about these kinds of more traditional patriarchal ideas, you know. Yeah, here and then, yeah, quick. Great question. Yeah, uh, it, there's tremendous strain on the on it because of the one-child policy, because now four sets, four parents are essentially kind of devolving onto fewer and fewer kids. Um, the odd thing is that, of course, there is no more one-child policy, but because China has developed, I mean, China has developed so remarkably. In the last 25 years, they brought 360 million people out of poverty into a middle class. That's more people than we have in our country. <laughs> That's awesome, right? Well, with that, what's happened, everything's more expensive. Housing, education, women are working full time outside the home often. So now they, people don't want to have more than one kid, one, one child. So even though there's no more child, one child, uh, what's happening there is happening globally, right? Um, so yes, filial piety as, as when my wife's generation, they didn't have things like old age homes was a hard concept. And they used to say, oh, people in the West do that. But now they do. They have to. So it's how it will evolve, who knows, but it's definitely put a huge strain on it for reasons you could see. Good. I think. Well, unfortunately, the midshipmen have to go to class. So uh, oh, wow. thanks for your, your time and wisdom. And uh, you have time to stay if, if students don't Right. And if people now. have questions, please. Uh, uh, have Professor Barrett give you my email. I'm, uh, yeah. I, I sit at home in the mornings, uh, oh, you know, oh, 50, uh, maybe 0500 hours usually I get up and wait for someone to write me. No, no, I don't, I don't think, but I will respond to you if, if you, if you write to me and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you.